I'm going to go ahead and start recording. So for those of you who are on the phone, my hope is that you can, I sent along the PowerPoint ahead of time so you guys can follow along on that printout or on your screen because I know you can't see the screen for the webinar itself. So I'm hoping that you have that. If not, you can unmute yourself and um, tell me if you need any help with that. But it was in the email that I sent um, with the instructions. And I will try and be good about whenever I switch screens or move forward that you guys can also uh, know kind of where I am. <laughs> can everybody see the screen okay? For those of you guys who are on the webinar, um, you can also chat, but also on the phone, you can unmute yourself and tell me if you, well, I guess you can't see the screen anyways. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Taryn Glidewell. I'm the nutrition manager for Harvesters. And today we're going to talk about nudges. One thing that I want to make sure everybody knows is that towards the end, there will be a few more questions. I want to make sure everybody who's on here gets credit for being on here. So do stay till the end. There's some more resources that I can send out to you, some more research about nudges, as well as a survey to see what you found helpful. I know that everybody has a different understanding of nudges and everybody's doing different things around nudges. And so there's even an opportunity in that survey for you guys to even upload pictures in case you guys are doing things at your agencies. We would love to see what you're doing. And so picture sharing is a beautiful thing. Okay. So for slide two, in case you guys are looking at your own printout. So health and hunger. Historically, food pantries have focused on filling empty stomachs with whatever food is available. Much of this food tends to be highly processed and full of fat, sugar, and sodium. These are easily accessible, non-nutrient dense foods, and they may temporarily alleviate hunger pangs, but ultimately they can also contribute to chronic disease such as obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, amongst other things. And so we want to introduce this new concept or tagline that the opposite of hungry isn't full, it's healthy. And so that changes the conversation from one of quantity to that of quality. And so if that's a helpful little catchphrase that is not mine, um, feel free to steal it. Um, we just think that that's helpful in case you want to use that at your agency. So the good news here is that a lot of the things that we're doing, um, I would say that anybody at any agency would know anecdotally that nudges work or that marketing works, but actually the report that I'm going to send out after this talks about how there's actual research to prove these things now. And so there's numbers about, and we'll get to that later on in the slides, uh, but I'll send out that report in case there's any need for you to get buy-in, be that with your board, staff, volunteers, anybody who's like, that's a great idea, but it's not really going to work. We actually have proof that it can and does work and it helps people be healthy and it helps you move food. So it's a win-win. Um, there's also gonna be some other resources. I send out some other websites in case that's helpful. Um, one of the things that Nudges is extremely helpful with is produce. And I know each agency has different needs or wants with produce. Some of them are able to take on a lot of produce. Some people are hesitant to take on produce because um, storage of that produce, how often you're open, those kinds of things. There's a lot of ways that Nudges can help, especially with produce. But in general, it's trying to help us move those healthy items that guests might not know what to do with as much. So in case you're leery about produce or have questions about produce, this is very much helping answer some of those questions. So the next slide, food security. So in the US, our primary concern is a food insecurity, not actual hunger. In other words, uh, people in the US are not dying due to lack of sufficient energy or calories, as is commonly known with starving children in developing countries. In the US, people are struggling with food security and the paradox of being overfed and yet undernourished. So these, the term here is actually nutrition insecurity. So we could actually be eating enough food, but not the right um, nutrition, if that makes sense. So there's a different nutrition out there. Um, food security definition, when all people at all times have access to sufficient, safe, nutritious food to maintain a healthy and active life. So I don't know if you guys have gone out there and looked around, but there's definitely a lot of different definitions for food security. 
Um, I definitely underlined here sufficient, safe, nutritious, because that is a, a different concept versus a lot of food. We can all have a lot of food, but if we're not able to function as we need to function, that's different. Uh, we want to make sure everybody has good quality of life as long as they possibly can, right? And so we want to make sure we have healthy foods. The next slide or screen for those of you guys on the phone. Um, if it'll work for me, there we go. So some of you guys are aware of the hunger study or what we call Hunger in America 2014. And some of you guys have heard me say this before, but Hunger in America, the 2014 version, um, it was the largest, most comprehensive study of hunger in America. The study provides a snapshot of the people Harvesters Network is helping. Um, about their circumstances, the challenges they face, and the difficult choices they make between food, rent, utilities, health care, etc. Many of your agencies participated in this study. If you were around in 2014, thank you very much. So the difference in the 2014 study versus previous studies is this is the first time that we ask questions not only about people's employment, their demographics, and their housing, but we also ask questions about their health. And you'll see that on the next slide. So moving forward on the next slide. Some of the health findings, there's a lot more than just this. I pulled these two out specifically, that 62% of the households served within Harvesters, 26 counties, 62% of those households have at least one member with high blood pressure. And that's pretty high compared to even the national average of food bank populations. Um, and then 37% of our households have a member with diabetes, and that's also higher than the national average of food banks. The next slide talks about, um, we asked the guests what they would like more of. And so 52% of them said they do want more fresh fruits and veggies. And so that's, you know, you've seen a change from harvesters and trying to help you get capacity to access those. We've put produce on the menu. We've done a variety of things to help you get those foods to the, to the guests. They want protein food items. And so we've done things like added a clean room so that we can repack a lot of protein items for you guys. And then they're asking, 47% are asking for more dairy products. So we have things like the Milk to My Plate program, et cetera. So we're listening to what you guys have said and what the guests have said. And so we fully understand that a lot of these kinds of things, what do they need? They need a lot of refrigeration, right? And so we're working on a lot of those things. Do note that the produce on the menu is shelf stable. So it does not require refrigeration. So that's, to me, a good, easy place to start. It will last longer than other produce, but it is still as if I'm sure some of you guys have received it, it's still going to be on its hind legs, but it is still produce that is durable. Um, okay, so next slide. So nudges. This is um, interesting because not everybody can actually answer on the webinar, so I get that. But I just want to, if you can, uh, chime in on the chat board or if you could unmute yourself on the phone. How many of you guys are unfamiliar with what this is? How many of you guys are familiar with it, but you're not really doing anything about it yet? How many of you folks are implementing it and just looking to do better and to optimize uh, what you're doing with nudges? And then how many folks are implementing and evaluating nudges on a regular basis? And I'm going to be honest that probably most people are not doing the last guy, <laughs> the implementing and evaluating on a regular basis. Because uh, the good news is this webinar is for everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about if you're new to it altogether or if you're doing things, but you're just like, I can totally do better. Are there other folks? Okay, thanks, Kaylee. Are there other folks who can tell us how familiar you are with the nudges? Um, I, I'm Erin, by the way. Hi. Um, I'm unfamiliar with nudges, but that is something that we have been trying to implement into our program. I have a residential boys' home, and then we also have a home for adults with developmental disabilities. Okay, thanks, Erin. So one thing that I want to make sure everybody hears me say, I don't think it's in any of my PowerPoint. A lot of the nudges that I'm going to show you guys have more pictures, and I might even use language that is more specific to a pantry setting. However, that does not mean that's the only place you can implement nudges. So I'm glad you brought that up, um, being it as a, at a residential site. Um, nudges happen everywhere we go. They're at um, farmer's markets. They're at grocery stores. They're in kitchens, they're everywhere. And so they can be implemented anywhere. Um, and we, if I don't speak to that, Aaron or anybody else, feel free to always call or email me and I can talk about what it might look like at your site. Again, a lot of the pictures and things that we're gonna talk about today 
Um, because they're local examples, um, we're focusing more on the pantry, but it's the same concepts anywhere. So I hope that's helpful. All right, thanks, Molly. I see yours too. Um, okay, I'm going to move forward just for the sake of time. We got to. I am. This is going to be a mouthful. <laughs> we have lots and lots of pictures. Um, so I'm going to keep cruising. So these are two videos that I will send you those links as well after we follow up because it will take time that we don't have. They're both brief, maybe two-ish minutes per, but I just want to make sure you guys can see it's an example. Um, essentially, nudges, the next slide talks about their high-impact, low-effort ways to help your clients make the healthy choice the easy choice. And I'll talk about what that means, the healthy choice, the easy choice, in a few slides. The good news um, that I think everybody loves is the high impact, low effort. We have very little time, um, but we also want to make a big impact. And so this is one way that, again, there is science to prove that these things are very effective. They can also help you move those perishable foods faster and showcase some unknown items to your guests, as well as help those guests intake of healthy produce and lowering food waste, which is a definite win. Um, so that's kind of what I said. You might have perishable foods that you're sitting on and you need to move it pretty quickly. It also helps showcase because, you know, from harvesters, if you do grocery store recovery, from wherever you're getting some of these produce items, your guests might not know what in the world that is. I've been to some pantries where we got beautiful artichoke carts, but guests walk right by it because they don't know what it is. And so nudges are going to be the answer to some of this. These are best utilized in a client choice model pantry, and there's a lot of different versions of client choice, um, but that would be true of a client choice kitchen setting as well. Essentially, whenever they are choosing, we're trying to help them choose healthier and make healthy choices, if that makes sense. There are definitely some recipes you can hand out if you are just giving them pre-bagged items, but that's not exactly the same as a nudge, which we're talking about today. This does require volunteer or staff buy-in for this effort. So you want to make sure if you are the person who's doing it or if you are just the person who's in charge and trying to get other folks to do it, you'll want that buy-in. And the good news is this is what the nutrition department can help you with if you're struggling to get that buy-in from your staff or volunteers. So if you have interest in nutrition education, um, most people, when they think of the nutrition department or nutrition education, they think classes. If you have that interest in the education but you don't have enough people, you don't have enough resources like a classroom, you don't have funding, you do not have to have classes, that's not the only answer. Nudges are a great way that any agency can implement any day um, and you can do as much or as little as you want. Um, I know that I've said this before but it can definitely help reduce food waste and we are not in the business of wasting food and so high five to all you guys. The next slide. Um, talks a little bit more about the nudges. So it emerged from the field. There's an actual field of study called behavioral economics. Um, they are subconscious cues in the environment. So people don't even necessarily know they exist. They're subconscious. Um, they are low cost and low resource requirements. And they are proven, like I said before, grocery stores, school cafeterias, restaurants, farmers markets, etc. cetera. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have been to farmers markets, but you know some farmers do a better job than others. You walk around and they've got a really pretty display at their booth. They've got recipes sitting out. They might even let you taste test their watermelon or whatever. And your eyes are kind of drawn to those booths and you're more likely to purchase from them because you know what to do with it. You've got that recipe. So it's the same concept. Um, it's also just along the lines of positive reinforcement. So this can lead people to make certain decisions if you kind of give them a pat on the back like, look at you, you're doing great, you're feeding your kids two cups of fruit a day. Like just messaging like that really help people feel better about the, what they're doing. Um, I'm trying to think what else might be helpful. They're just subtle cues and so we'll, I'll, you'll obviously see what this looks like. It's just a marketing strategy at the end of the day. So. Um, like I said, we think of it as this tagline, making the healthy choice the easy choice. So Taryn's example for this is recycling. Um, a few years ago, we did not have curbside recycling where I lived, and so I had to really care about recycling to make sure I did it, right? I had to make sure I separated things. I have to take it to a certain place that's only open certain days, and so I really got to love and believe in recycling for me to do it. When it became curbside, I don't really have to love it. I can just be lazy and still recycle. And so that is a nudge. The city made it easier for people to recycle by coming out and bringing the curbside buckets and the people to pick it up. 
And so, again, some of those people who are less likely to seek it out are going to be able to access it. I hope that's a helpful example. Um, so here's um, signage, colors. I'm sorry, I flipped to the next screen. Factors such as signage, colors, packaging, and product placement all influence our choices as consumers. Anybody who's ever worked at a grocery store, you know all these things happen, right? People pay better money for certain shelves. They pay more money for those end caps, or that's where those things that the grocery store wants to highlight, like sales or you know, seasonal promotion kinds of things. All right, the next slide. So this is more, um, we're just going to tell some stories. So what if? What would happen if the food shelf environment was set up to encourage people to choose more fruits and vegetables? And you can kind of see some of the examples here of some of the bins that you could put things in that just look more appealing, right? What if fruits and vegetables were displayed in an attractive, visible, and even beautiful way? And there's a different variety of produce bins for you. What if fruit and vegetable displays included vibrant signage? and shelf labels. So again, sometimes you're like, what is that thing? Is that an apple? Is that a potato? Is that a jicama? That guy's a rutabaga. So you could just put a little clip with a little picture of this is rutabaga, and it gives you a very, very, very simple, basic recipe right then and there, right? Um, you can also actually print recipes if you want to and put it right next to the rutabaga as well. That is a strategy besides just the sign of what it is. Uh, we definitely recommend very basic recipes, no more than nine ingredients. They're easy to read, simple to follow. They don't involve a whole lot of um, interesting ingredients or difficult um, equipment, those kinds of things. I would even say, so rutabaga might be an extreme example. People, you know, that's not as common. But there's very common things that people don't know what to do with, like dried beans. They're used to canned beans, but maybe not dried beans. Or they're used to instant rice, but maybe not... Um, standard rice. And so it doesn't even have to be something that you're like, this is a rare item. It could be just those things that people aren't as used to these days. Um, a good example is here at the harvester shopping floor. We have so many brown bananas that go to waste. And it's not difficult to utilize brown bananas, but if you're the one shopping and picking up on behalf of the agency and you don't know cooking, you think that's just trash. And so even for us at Harvesters, making sure that those who are ordering food for your agency, those who are picking up, we try and do education for those people to say, what can you do with brown bananas, right? You can do smoothies, you can do banana bread, you can do quite a variety of things. So not a rare item, just maybe an, a rare form of that item. <laughs> um, what if things look like you might see at a farmer's market, like I already said earlier? What if the food pantry was filled with comforting and welcoming smells? So whenever we do demonstrations at agencies or even on our shopping floor, we try and do it so when we're cooking, you can smell the whole experience. You're not walking into something that's already made. Just like whenever, you know, you walk into your grandma's house at Christmas or Thanksgiving, it just smells like the, the foods you're familiar with and it entices you more because we eat with more than just our mouths, right? We eat with our eyes and our nose. And so... Those smells are even helpful. Next slide. What if visitors had a chance to taste a particular vegetable they thought they didn't like? So here's an example right here um, where we give an example. We do a little taste test. So you can see right next to the produce there is um, a little piece of paper where we say beforehand, what did you think this was? How likely would you have been to just take this off of our shelf? And then we provide the taste test. You can see the skillet in the background. And then we say, okay, now after, are you willing to take this item? And we can definitely see an increase of people just with tasting. And my best example is always like Costco or Sam's on a Saturday. They are doing it on purpose because we all know that tasting is the way to believe, right? And so it's highly effective. Now, there does it does require some health inspection and some other kinds of food safety things that we're not going to get into here today. You can definitely ask me um, how you might be able to implement this at your site. Just know that there are some health department regulations when it involves cooking at your site. And there are ways to get, not to get around them, but to figure that out for you. Um, so here's an example of beets. Same thing, we've got beets. Um, simple, easy recipe, and people are more likely to take it afterwards. So behavioral economics research has offered creative and intuitive strategies to nudge people in a way that makes fruits and vegetables an easier choice. So <clears throat> again, Taryn's example of what does this mean? 
the healthy choice, the easier choice, or here in this example, fruits and vegetables, the easier choice. And my example is we all know what to do with a Whopper. There are copious amounts of um, marketing for Whoppers. It's pretty obvious everybody knows what to do with it. There's not a lot of marketing for rutabaga. There's not a lot of um, commercials for beets or things like that, right? And so it helps just what I call level the playing field. It helps people know what to do with something because maybe we haven't been exposed to it. Um, when we teach nutrition classes, we go out and you'd be surprised there's so many people who don't know what a kiwi is or what even a mandarin orange is, which to me seems obvious, but it is not obvious at all. And so it just helps people become more familiar with them because they can be very scary if you haven't been exposed to those items. So here's just an example of what one agency did. So again, I just think of it as marketing and I don't want to use the example of Martha Stewart because I think Martha Stewart intimidates people, <laughs> but is that just creating a welcoming environment and thinking of it as if you were hosting people at your home, like how would you welcome them to a meal, to a menu, those kinds of things. So more questions or um, examples and pictures. So individuals are more receptive to adding foods that are healthier to their diet than they are to eliminating unhealthy foods. This is a big deal, right? So we can say all day long, hey, maybe don't eat that Coke. If you tell me not to eat chips, I'm sorry, I will not listen because I love chips so very much. However, I am more receptive to adding other healthier foods than I am to decreasing the amount of chips that I eat. So this, I would say, if you are finding or facing any struggles at your agency because you're trying to push people eating less of the unhealthy, it is, you're going to meet with a lot of resistance, a lot, a lot. Um, and even at the food bank level, I mean, a lot of levels, that's not the place to start. The place to start is encouraging of the healthier foods and providing more of those healthier foods than decreasing the less healthy. The next slide, uh, people, are respo people respond to sensory experiences and immediate gratification, right? Um, we, displaying healthy foods prominently atta draws attention to them and may increase their consumption. So Taryn's example of this is always, you know, whenever you go to some pantries or even on our shopping floor, if the food is in a weird box in a dark corner, you're not as likely to take it as if it was on a pretty stand or in a pretty basket and some of the um, not so pretty ones are cooled out, right? And so it's all about that display. And it, it's obvious, it's not in some dark corner where you gotta really want it and try and figure out what that thing is. So an attractive presentation may influence choosing healthy food over unhealthy food. So it might literally just be, maybe you already get lots of produce, but it doesn't move. Maybe the only thing you need to do at your agency is just put it in a different container and you'll be surprised. I'll show you some pictures down the road of how much more people take it just because of the container that it's in. Next slide. Changing the physical placement of specific food items um, to make them stand out can increase their consumption. So notice how this is in the middle of the room. It's not along the wall as part of the flow. It's actually standing out. And they do this at grocery stores. Sometimes you have to trip over things and they want you to have to see it and walk around it. So you have to engage with it versus just on autopilot or cruise control when you're in um, your favorite grocery store. Next slide, changing the containers used to display certain foods such as attractive baskets and bowls can influence someone's choice to eat those foods. Next screen, an individual's willingness to try something new and decide that they will like it is greatly influenced by the people around them. So the example here is, this is where you need that buy-in from your staff or volunteers. As soon as you increase the amount of healthy foods you get, I'm sure some of you guys have stories of your staff and volunteers who um, might not like those items. And so they actually poo-poo them to the, to the guests and like, oh, I wouldn't, oh, that's weird. I wouldn't try that. And they are thwarting your efforts right there. And so you definitely need to make sure that your staff and volunteers have that buy-in. Even if they don't know what those food items are, that is totally okay. Not everybody has, I don't like eggplant. I'm not going to make sure everybody at my pantry loves eggplant before we implement these. The point is we just want to make sure we're all in, on the same team and trying to help people. So even if I don't personally like it, I'm not going to dissuade people from taking it, right? The next slide. Uh, the power of word of mouth advertising has an impact far greater than simply providing information about why we should make healthy food choices. I think at this stage as adults, most of us know why we should. That's not really the issue. The issue is making believers out of each other. Um, and making it approachable and easy. No one's perfect. No one's eating only the perfect 
healthy things. So if somebody says, somebody who I also know isn't the biggest vegetable fan says, oh my gosh, I tried it and it was actually really good, then I'm more likely to try it, right? And so this is where, again, that buy-in from the staff and volunteers. If you try those samples that somebody makes or if you've um, had it at home, who knows what, then you could say, oh no, it was actually really good and I'm a human just like you and I have things that I don't like and that's okay. So word of mouth advertising goes a long ways. You can put up the coolest signs in the whole wide world all around your pantry, your kitchen, but as soon as one person kind of is that naysayer, it's going to thwart a lot of efforts. So food pantries can have an untapped potential to make an even bigger impact at an individual and community level. And I hope you guys feel that you have that power. Um, you can really influence what people are eating in your community. So this is where I'm gonna send out um, the nudge report in case, like I said, you need actual stats to prove to people that it's effective. Some people need that, some don't. But so how effective are they? They can increase the likelihood, this is just one example, they increase the likelihood that a client took at least one healthy food item by 46% on average. That's not small potatoes, that is a hefty number. Nudges also increase the amount of healthy food distributed by 56 per client on average, 56% per client on average. That means that when a nudge intervention was in place, clients who were typically taking about two healthy items took about three instead. So sometimes it shifts people, those who don't take any healthy food, they might take some. Those who take some might take more. So, and again, at a staggering percentage. So here's just one testimonial um, from a pantry volunteer. We're getting rave reviews. The most important to me are the comments about how it's making our recipients feel more at ease and more likely to come to the food shelf or food pantry. Um, again, you will see, I mean, some, some in the report that I'm going to send, some examples say, if you put something twice in the, your line, so if you have a whole lot of bread, which everybody here probably has a whole lot of bread <laughs> from harvesters or other sites, sometimes just simply putting that twice in your line at the beginning and then again at the end, it actually increased the percentage that people would take those, that whole wheat bread by 90%, just a matter of putting it twice. Um, and the reason being that sometimes people, um, think that they want it, but they're not really ready to commit yet. And so then whenever you put it at the end again, they're like, oh, I actually did want that. I do want to take it now. Um, most pantries and kitchens are set up where you kind of get shuttled through a flow and there's one time, one pass through. And so my example for this is always all of us at buffets, right? If you only get one pass through, you're not always going to commit to the things up front. If you're like, oh man, I don't know if there's going to be pot roast at the end or whatever your favorite thing is at the end. So sometimes we're hesitant to just fill things at the beginning. And so letting people even, this goes into client choice more, but letting people shop versus through one line, but just anywhere they want to can help people take more as well. But um, I will send out that nudge report so you can read for yourself how effective they actually are. Um, even on things that people don't like as much, cabbage, rutabagas, things that you might be scared of or staff volunteers, staff or volunteers might be scared of. There are ways to increase the consumption of these things. So the next slide talks about the pantry readiness checklist. And like I said to you, Aaron, and to any others who are working more in a kitchen or shelter site, this can work at those sites. It, the, the concepts are the same. The implementation is a little bit different. But so do you already have a client choice distribution style? And there's so many versions of client choice, but um, you, you want to have that to some level. Is there a reliable supply of the food item to be nudged? So if you only have three cabbages, you probably don't need to nudge it as much as if you have five containers of it. Um, is there a sufficient client demand for healthier food? So are clients asking for these things? Is there an opportunity to nudge perishable healthy food? So do you have that produce? Do you have some of those perishable items that you really want to nudge? Um, are you taking into account the cultural appropriateness? So if you work with a guests who are in a Hispanic neighborhood, are you getting maybe some of those produce items that they might be more likely to take? Or are you getting something else that they might not be likely to take? And so that is a different issue that we would want to talk about. Is there interest in nutrition education? But like I said earlier, limited funding, resources, time, people, space, what have you available. Um, do you have different staff or volunteers within the organization all aligned on nudges? As in, are you guys all on the same page? Do you want to offer this? Are you ready to offer this? And do you have policies supportive of using nudges to move healthy foods? So another, that's, a same, that's the same question as are you guys aligned? Are you guys all in agreement that this is a good thing to do? So here's some more pictures and some um, where we start to define some of the strategies. So easy takeaways, placement. 
Shoppers are less inclined to take items as their baskets fill up. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, um, but we recommend the healthy stuff at the beginning and the less healthy stuff at the end. And you'll be surprised how, if you just rearrange how the pantry is set up, how people are less likely to take things towards the end. Like, oh, I've actually got quite a bit of food. Whereas if you put the pastries and the donuts and the whatever first, you will absolutely notice they take more of those things because they don't know what else is coming down the line at, at the pantry or like I said, in the kitchen too. So for this reason, it's important to place foods to encourage those healthy items early in a shopper's path when their baskets are relatively empty. So you can see my little example, uh, fruits, veggies, grain items, protein items, and then after that might be things like your pastries, what have you. The next slide, signage, signage helps. So waiting areas, I don't know if you guys have considered the waiting areas that you have. So it's not just what happens in the pantry, it's really the whole experience that guests have. But your waiting areas are great places to encourage healthy food selection. You can put up posters that display attractive images of foods to encourage that can lead shoppers to select the pictured items when they're making food choices. So they're a captive audience in your waiting room and some people wait longer than others in waiting rooms, but sometimes you can just put up a my plate poster with some pretty examples of what those things are that kind of what we call primes people to be thinking um, about healthy foods um, parents are more likely to think of health regarding their kids than themselves and so if you can use it to sway them to say hey here's what kids need to be healthy and to develop well you can kind of use that language you can put up chalkboards you can put up you know um, white like dry erase boards to say here's the produce that we have today Here's the, you know, some meal ideas that we have today. If you put up some, and you'll see this later, zucchini with some noodles, with some uh, marinara. So you can put all these signage things up in the waiting room. The next slide, abundance counts. So the appearance of abundance also leads to greater selection. So showcasing food, foods to encourage will increase the amount of healthy food that people select. It also means the opposite of true. Decreasing the visibility of less nutritious foods will limit their selection. So when you want to showcase fresh produce, present items in containers that appear to be fully stocked. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this at the grocery store. You're like, oh, I don't want to take the last thing or the last few things. And so people are, have that same mentality at pantries. They're like, I bet somebody else will need it more. And so you want to try it as much as you can, try and keep things fully stocked. So if a shelf box or crate appears mostly empty, shoppers are more likely to pass up those contents. Something else that you can also do is to encourage by putting signs up about things like a family of four usually takes at least eight tomatoes or a family of three usually takes at least five because sometimes people are scared to take what they think might be too much. They might not know that you have a whole storage room full of more for this picture right here, more cabbages. They might think that what they see is all there is. So if you kind of give them prompts to say, usually families take at least these kinds of things, then it helps them understand that feel free. We know that you can kind of have this many things. Okay, the next slide, visibility. Uh, visibility is key. Shoppers like to see the products they're choosing, right? We all do. Encourage, or sorry, ensure the visibility of foods to encourage items by angling the food crate down so the crate slip does not obscure the shopper's view. This truly showcases the product, which can help increase its selection. And I'm going to show you a picture of this next. Um, but, you know, if you have to reach really far high up or down into a crate, you really got to want it, right? And so if you make it easy to grab, they're going to be more likely to grab those things. So here's an example of good, better, and best. So convenience. If you have to reach far down, especially if we've got seniors, they're just going to be less likely to take it, right? And so it's the same thing as what's happening on the grocery store aisles. People pay good money for that eye level um, shelf, right? Okay, next slide. So here's some strategies. Again, you can look at your reports to see how effective these are or how they work and how to implement them. I'm going to keep cruising though. So um, like I said, multiple, inter multiple exposures. This involves increasing the number of times and locations that a food item is offered in the distribution line. And the example that I always see in the grocery store is, you know, there's a whole candy aisle, but yet they still put the candy right by the checkout line, right? Just in case you forgot to go down that candy aisle, they're not going to let you stop without getting that or a soda or gum or whatever. So it's the exact same concept. And I guarantee they sell a lot of those things right next to that checkout aisle. So multiple exposures to whole wheat bread, because we know that that's something that people struggle with, led to an 89% increase in the likelihood that a client took at least one loaf. And so that's just putting it twice in your line. It's pretty simple. 
Um, another one, signage, um, involves using marketing materials like posters or shelf tags. And you can see with this oatmeal, there's a little shelf tag here. Um, with text used to promote the items, ideally displayed in prominent locations. And so we recommend that if you're going to put signage up, that it's right next to the item. People don't always make the connection that what I see over here in this room is what I'm going to see over there in that room or where it is. Um, so this example says oatmeal fills you longer. It's really, really simple. For people who are hungry, they want things that are going to fill them up longer. As my mom used to say, it sticks to your ribs, and so it fills you up longer. It could just be promoting those kinds of things like how, what it does for your body or how it makes you feel. Um, so this particular intervention, they put signage with the shelf tag for oatmeal next to it. It increased the likelihood that clients took oatmeal by 202% just because of that sign. Okay, the next slide. So display change. The idea behind display change nudge lies in the tendency of individuals to relate the quality of a food item to the quantity, or sorry, quality of its storage and presentation. So if something is in a weird box or if it's in a weird area, you kind of assume, oh, it's probably not that nice. The, the same strategy is going on in thrift stores. If you make it look nice in a thrift store, we all know it's been used. We all know that somebody else has had it. But different thrift stores have different vibes. And so how they present that, if they've washed it, if they've hung it nicely, if they've done a little model, then you're more likely to take those things than if they're just in a bin somewhere in a corner, right? Same idea here. So it helps us, it makes us think it's worth more if it looks nicer. Um, so the display change increased the likelihood that a client took cabbage by 42% and it increased the average amount of cabbages taken by 56% because all they did was move from cardboard tote to heavy duty plastic crates. crates. That's all they did. The next slide, here's some pictures. So this is um, one of our AmeriCorps a couple years ago doing a tasting at a pantry one day when they're open. And so I don't even remember what tasting she was doing, but we don't have to take up a lot of room. This is something any one of your volunteers could do if they have that knack. It's also something extension could do. Um, again, there are food safety things you need to be considerate of. And so if you have questions about that, you can ask us. Next slide. So here's an example of one of our pantries in Topeka. They rearranged um, their food pantry. It's a very, very small space, but they rearranged their pantry according to the food groups. They put the healthy ones at the beginning. So you can see they've painted the walls, um, grains, orange for what, what it's on the my plates, and then protein is purple. At the very back, they put um, a weird brownish color. They did that on purpose because um, psychology works. <laughs> and they kind of wanted to make the less healthy items less attractive. So they're not saying you can't take it. They're not saying, um, they're not even not offering them. They're just making it less attractive. And you will be astounded that they've had a lot fewer people take those items just because their basket's are already full. It's less prominent in their pantry and it just doesn't look as inviting. So they've even stopped, they've started ordering less of those unhealthy items from us because the client demand is lowered. Um, these are some pantries who, you know, every pantry has different setup. This is just on a table. If all you guys have is tables, it totally works in those environments as well. They just arranged it by the rainbow, which I find highly attractive. So just thinking about how does it look on your table or on your shelf. Um, so here's an example I told you before. They did minimal changes. Um, this is one of our pantries who all they did, you can see on the bottom, they kind of tilted up those produce crates a little bit. It's the produce crates that you get from harvesters when you order the hard seven produce. And they just put something underneath it so it tipped it up and made it easier for people to see, you know, when things could, um, they could reach them easier. And all they did was change. So on the top, they just got like dollar store bins, those green bins, they all look uniform. And before they were having trouble moving all the produce, they're only open one day and they have to, you know, take down shop every afternoon. And before they had lots of leftovers of produce, all they did was put it in those containers, pretty simple, and now they're empty of all their produce every time. And they were thrilled that that's all they had to do to make it move faster. You can see there's no signage. There's not a whole lot of fancy going on here, but it's working. Another example, so on the left, um, as soon as guests walk in, it looked like a storage room. There was just a lot of boxes and odds and ends all together. And now front and center, we've got produce. Um, what we don't see here is they've even bumped it up more where they have big signs that say produce and they have more signage going on. But the very first thing that people see when they walk in is that produce. So they're more ample to take those things. 
um, are more apt to take those things. You can even see just the fact that these are nicer shelves than the wooden shelves on the left. So it, you don't have to do this, but it's just a simple thing. They also happen to be going through a remodel, so they even painted the walls. So the walls are nicer color, there's better lighting. Um, but that was an aside to these nudges. It did help the nudge, but it wasn't mandatory. The next slide, um, another example is this pantry, all they used to have was tables and all they did was move to shelves. And so it's doing a few things. Number one, it helped them to store more food so they had to restock less often. They're also a pop-up shop so they have to put everything out that day and take it back down that day. So they could keep more things out and available to guests, but they could also start to put the healthier things at eye level, um, the less healthier things up higher down low, and they saw an, an increase in how many people were choosing the healthy food. So here's just some before and after examples. So we all have you know, interesting things that we've all inherited at pantries or kitchens about the way that we have them. And so on the left is just, I know it's kind of a bad picture, but just using whatever we have, because that's what a lot of um, agencies have, is you know, whatever has been given them. But there are plenty of Boy Scout troops. There's plenty of other agencies out there that'd be happy to build you some of these things that are very easy to build and very durable. So on the right is just simply putting it in wooden crates that go up and down. So again, it's gonna increase the amount that you can put out. As you can see, there's more space going on here, but it's also prettier. Um, this is one of our pantries in um, Linden, and they put, they had, this is, they actually had the Boy Scouts create this for them, and you can see on there that they're using the Harvester's collapsible produce crate, so that's just Harvester's Hard 7, 